Calvary Church is dedicated to doctrine, and we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's Word and applying it to your life. So we explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book. This is Expound. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 1 Kings. We left off in chapter 15. We read down to verse 24, but we just read it quickly, and I, I, promise, I gave you a cliffhanger. I said that something was going on with King Asa, and I want to get back to that. We're dealing with the divided kingdom, the kingdom that was once united as a monarchy under Saul, then David, then Solomon is now split into north and south. They are at odds with each other. It is becoming a civil war situation, generation after generation. But it is a monarchy still, not united, it's divided, but a monarchy nonetheless. That is, there is a single ruler, a king. He's the law of the land. Now hold that thought, because today Israel is no longer a monarchy. Today it is a republic, a parliamentary republic. People vote, and they have a parliament. There's a prime minister who really is the executive branch of the country. They have a president that is more or less a figurehead like a king or queen would be, but important nonetheless. Now I'm bringing that up because just a few hours ago, the president of Israel, Isaac Herzog, spoke to the joint session of Congress. He spoke about the fact that it is Israel's 75th, modern Israel's 75th anniversary as a nation and thanked the United States for its longstanding support, what he called an ironclad friendship. But he mentioned something interesting. He said, it's the beginning of the Jewish month of Av, A-V, Av. And the month of Av traditionally is a month, he said, wherein the Jews mourn. They mourn the destruction of the temple historically. They mourn the captivity years ago that they went into in Babylon. And while they were in captivity, they mourned and cried to God to deliver them and bring them back to their homeland. And then he said, our prayer is right out of the book of our Isaiah, the prophet, where Isaiah said, they will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither will they learn war anymore. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said in today's speech. With rousing applause from certain ones in our representative body, but not unanimously. But the fact that he brought up the month of Av and that traditionally it was a time where Jews mourned their captivity and longed to be back in their homeland, I thought, well, that's interesting because in tonight's Bible study, we are discovering chapter by chapter the very reason for their captivity. How they sinned against the covenant that God made with them and with their forefathers, and therefore God predicted, you are, you're, you're getting kicked out of the land, I promised you. I'll bring you back, but you're going you're gonna to get spanked. And so I thought of the full circle element of modern Israel and ancient Israel, no longer a monarchy, yes, a parliamentary republic, nonetheless, even they today, in their recent history, year by year, this month, are celebrating the truths that you and I are studying in this book of 1 Kings. I just thought you should uh, be aware of that if you didn't know that already, but I found that very interesting. Now, we told you we're dealing with Asa, the king of Judah, right here in chapter 15. A-S-A -A is his name, Asa. And uh, he is one of the good kings of Judah. If you remember last week, I said of the 19 kings 
in the southern kingdom of Judah, there will be 19 kings. Eight of them were good. Of the northern kingdom, none of them were good. So Asa is one of those good guys. In that, his heart at first was turned toward the Lord. He wanted to honor the Lord. He wanted to bring in spiritual reform. He didn't want idols in his land. He broke down the statues that people worshipped and the groves that people were celebrating in. Tore those up. And he even kicked his grandmother off from being the queen mother. I like a guy who has the chutzpah, as the Jews would say, to love God more than father or mother, or in this case, grandma. But I want to take you back a few verses to a border dispute that sort of led to a problem with the northern kingdom. So Asa is the king down south. He's the king of Judah. Two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, ten tribes up north. Asa is facing a problem in that there is a border dispute going on just a few miles from HQ, from headquarters, Jerusalem being headquarters. But about four miles away in a town called Ramah, the northern king put a little roadblock there so that goods and services could not flow down, so that ammunition and and whatever else people uh, couldn't flow in. Interesting how that borders are so important in any country. And when there's a problem at the border, there's a problem in the country. Nothing's changed. We have a huge problem at our southern border. And it is only indicative of the greater problems that exist within the borders itself. So, in verse 17, we're backing up just a few verses. Baasha, the king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah, that's that border town, that he might not let he might let none go out or come into Asa, the king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and gold, not that was in his own personal bank account, but notice this, that was left in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. Anybody know what the house of the Lord is a reference to? The temple in Jerusalem, the temple of worship built by Solomon, that house of the Lord, the temple itself. So he took the silver and gold that was in the temple and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, the son of Hezion, the king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was between my father and your father. See, I've sent you a present of silver and gold. Come and break your treaty with Baasha, the king of Israel, and he will withdraw from me. It doesn't say that he went into the temple to pray to the Lord of the temple. That would have been a good move. For him to go into the temple and have a prayer meeting. Oh God, help us. We're being attacked. We're being besieged at the border. No, he didn't go into the temple to pray to the Lord of the temple. He went into the temple to rob the temple. And give it to a political ally. It was a smart move politically. It was a disaster spiritually. Because it shows instead of trusting in the Lord, which he should have been, that should have been his first recourse. Look at I brought reform into my country. I've broken down the idols. We've got a problem. Let's pray. That'd be a great demonstration. Rather, instead of trusting in the Lord, he is trusting in a political alliance, hoping that the king up in Syria, Damascus, Ben-Hadad, is going to create a diversion by attacking the northern kingdom 
to take the efforts away from the king of Israel and he'll have to retreat. So let there be a treaty between us, create a diversion. I've sent you a present, break your treaty with Baasha, the king of Israel, so he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa. So it worked, but hold that thought and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. He attacked Ijon, Dan, Abel, Beth, Ma'aka, and all of the Sea of Galilee area, that's Kinerot, with all the land of Naphtali. Now it happened when Baasha heard it that he stopped building Ramah and remained in Tirzah, went back home. So, yay, it worked! So far, so great, thought Asa. Now, we don't get the rest of the story here. But let me tell you a little bit of background that you will read about. And the reason I'm telling you in advance is because in 2 Chronicles 16 is the rest of the story. But it's going to be a while till we get there. So by that time, you will have forgotten because I will have forgotten. So when this happened, God sent to King Asa of Judah a prophet, a seer, by the name of Hanani. And Hanani came and said to Asa the king, because you did not trust in the Lord your God, but trusted rather in the king of Syria, you're going to have war the rest of your life. Then he said this, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the entire earth, that he might show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. Beautiful promise. I love that verse. But it's attached to the fact that the king made a political move, but no spiritual move. He didn't trust the Lord. He trusted in an alliance. Nothing wrong with making a political move, but not first. First, seek the Lord. First, get counsel from God. And so he says, you're going to have war all your days. Well, that didn't sit well with Asa. It says Asa became enraged, angry at the prophet, and put him in prison. So Asa was a good king generally, but he sure did not take constructive criticism very well. He put the man who gave him the word of God, the voice of God, threw him in jail. Now, there's a proverb you know about, Proverbs 29. He who is often reproved but hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Do you know that verse? Proverbs 29, verse 1. He who is often reproved but hardens his neck or hardens his heart, same thing, he's stiff-necked before the Lord, will come to destruction, will be destroyed, and, and that suddenly. So let's see what happens to Asa. Again, he's a good guy generally, but he's, he's sort of hardening his heart now. He put this prophet, not mentioned here, but mentioned in 2 Chronicles, put him in jail. Verse 22, then King Asa made a proclamation throughout all Judah. None was exempted. And they took away the stones and timber of Ramah, which Baasha used for building, And with them, King Asa built Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. I actually like this. And here's something where I will be kinder to Asa in. He was wrong in trusting a political alliance rather than God, but he was right in taking the materials that the enemy used and built something for his own country. And I I, I like this. I think that we should be in the habit of taking the things that the enemy has used against us and use them to build the work of the Lord. You have a testimony. You may have even failed in your past. No, I guarantee you, you've all failed in your past because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, self-included. But those very things that the enemy was working and building to be against us, whether it's an addiction, 
or a bad relationship or lessons that you've learned, God can use them to build your testimony. Take the things that the enemy was using against you. Use those things to build the work of the Lord. So this is a positive thing. The rest of all the acts of Asa, all his might that he did, the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? Yes, they are. And we'll get to that, God, Lord willing, someday before the rapture. <laughs> Maybe. But... Watch this, but in the time of his old age, I don't know when that is. Again, sometimes the Bible says people are old and they're like my age. <laughs> so, but in the time of his old age, whenever that was, he was diseased in his feet. We don't know what disease this was. Some say, well, it was probably gout. I doubt it. Gout was not a prevalent condition in the ancient Middle East. It was probably a vascular disease, a, a, an obstructive peripheral vascular disease, uh, seems to fit uh, this disease. It is mentioned also in Second Chronicles. It just says here that he was diseased in his feet and Asa rested with his fathers, was buried with his fathers in the city of David his father, then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. So again, this is the abridged version. The unabridged version in 2 Chronicles 16 says this, when he was old, he was diseased in his feet, and he sought the help of physicians, but did not seek the Lord. The implication of that is not that it's it's wrong to seek physicians, but that it's wrong to not seek the Lord. The implication is that if he would have sought the Lord, the Lord would have allowed him to complete his reign and have a longer life than what he had. But because he, again, see a pattern has been set up in his life. First, he's trusting the king of Syria. And he got away with that, put the guy in prison who spoke out against it. Now he has a personal disease. Instead of seeking the Lord first, he seeks the help of doctors. Nothing wrong with going to the doctor. Please don't hear that in this message tonight. <laughs> but come to the elders of the church, have them lay hands on you, anoint you with oil. The prayer of faith will save the sick. And if the Lord doesn't heal you, good. Find out what the doctor has to say. But you could save yourself a deductible payment if the Lord did heal you. So seek the Lord first. That's the idea. He sought the help of physicians and he didn't seek the Lord. So once again, this is King Asa, generally a good guy, brought reform, was not partial to his grandma, kicked her off the queen mother bit. But when he got older, he didn't finish well. This stuff scares me. I read so often in the Bible of people who started well and did not finish well. So excited. The seed that is uh, placed on the soil where it brings forth fruit or brings forth, you know, growth immediately. And there's all sorts of emotion and excitement. But in three years, in five years, in 10 years, in 40 years, what, what is that life doing? What is that person doing? Over the long haul, age and time are no guarantee of success. You can age out and end poorly. Or you can start well and end well. Or you can start poorly but end well. Of all those scenarios, ending well is preferable. No matter how you start it, you want to finish it out well. So, verse 24, Asa bit the dust, kicked the bucket, rested with his fathers, was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father, and Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. Now, Nadab, remember Nadab? Nadab, the son of 
Jeroboam. Nadab became king over Israel in the second year of Asa, the king of Judah, and he reigned over Israel, this is up north now, for two years. Nadab had a brother named Abijah. I'm just refreshing your memory. These names are not common names. They're confusing names, as I mentioned last week. Abijah was the son of Jeroboam who died. Remember, Mrs. Jeroboam disguised herself in last week's study, came to the house of the prophet. The prophet was blind, but God snitched on her. And so when she came into his house, even though he is blind, he said, Hi, Mrs. Jeroboam. You can't fool me. As soon as you go home, your son, who is sick, and that was Abijah, he's going to die. And, and he did die. So here is a remaining son. We don't know if he's older or younger. I presume he was younger than Abijah. But Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel. He was not a good king. By the way, the name Nadab means, in Hebrew, willing. Nadav, willing. And he was willing. He voluntarily continued in all the sin and wrongdoing of his dad. It was so bad that when we get to Second Chronicles, like around chapter 11, it says that Jeroboam and his sons, and this would be one of his sons, were responsible for extricating, kicking out of Israel, the northern kingdom, all the true priests of the Lord. And so they all fled down to Judah, where the temple worship was. But these two kings kicked the good guys out of the land. So he is willingly continuing in the sin of his father. Verse 26, he did evil in the sight of the Lord, walked in the way of his father, and in the sin by which he had made Israel sin. Then Baasha, the son of Ahijah of the house of Issachar, conspired against him. Now just watch how often this happens. This world of politics where one person conspires against another person. Nothing really has changed. And Baasha killed him at Gibbethon, which belongs to the Philistines. It was a Philistine stronghold. While Nadab and all of Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa, the king of Judah, and reigned in his place. And it was so when he became king that he killed all the house of Jeroboam. He did not leave to Jeroboam anyone that breathed until he had destroyed him according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. Because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he had sinned and by which he made Israel sin because of his provocation with which he provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. Now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? A reminder, we do not have that book. We only have the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah. So when it asked the question, I would say, Okay, yeah, but I've never read it, can't find it, we don't know where it is, so there you have it. So, in verse 32, there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all of their days. This ends now, completely ends, the first dynasty of the northern kingdom. Do you remember last week I said there were nine dynasties up north? There's only one down south. That's the dynasty of King David. God is going to make sure a lamp still burns for David and his progeny. But up north, there will be nine dynasties, nine separate houses, lineages, dynasties. The first dynasty is over. They're all dead. They're all killed. According to the word of the Lord, that, that unnamed prophet um, uh, spoke, and then also that uh, this other prophet, Ahijah the Shilonite, came and spoke against him. 
Again, I told you that you're going to see a lot of this kind of political intrigue in the next few chapters. And this seems to be the way of the world. You get one king that says, well, I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to make things different. You know, vote for me. I'll be the best king ever. And he gets to be king and it just, he takes it further in the wrong direction. Somebody else, oh, this is my chance to make something great. And, and what we learn about leadership, really of any kind, but in particular, this kind of autocratic political leadership, is always tends to corrupt. The more power a person has or concentrates to himself or herself, the more corrupting it becomes. This is just the way of the world. And it, it goes here from bad to worse. So much so that every time an election rolls around, I believe as a Christian I should be involved and vote, and I do. But it's wearying, this cycle of promises followed by broken promises, followed by more promises, followed by broken promises. And what I've come to understand is that man is incapable of governing himself. You say, well, the best form of government is a democracy. I disagree. It's a pretty good one. We in our democracy have checks and balances. I think it's a very healthy system. I think it's the best system so far uh, presently. We have a legislative branch, we have a judiciary, we have an executive branch. These are checks and balances in government, that's healthy. But any of these or all of these can become corrupted and manipulated. And it's no question that that is the case. And it's nothing new, it's always been the case. Now, I said that I don't believe democracy is the strongest and best form of government. That's right. I do not believe that is the strongest and best form of government. The best form of government is a theocracy, where God calls the shots. And everyone submits to that rule. At one time in Israel's history, th there was a theocracy as God brought them out of Egypt into the wilderness and shepherded them, governed them, brought them into their land, but then they wanted a king to be like other nations. You know the story. But one day, there will again be a theocratic kingdom on the earth, and it won't last four years. Will, will it last eight years? No, it'll last a thousand years. Amen. And it will be the most glorious form of government ever. The millennial kingdom age of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until then, we got to put up with these knuckleheads. <laughs> so there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. In the third year of Asa, the king of Judah, Baasha, the son of Ahijah, became king over all Israel in Tirzah. Tirzah is currently the capital of the northern kingdom. I know these are odd names, but we've read this before. So that's, Tirzah is the capital of the northern kingdom. And he reigned 24 years. Now we have the second dynasty up north, 10 northern tribes. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin by which he made Israel sin. Now we have five successive kings in the north. That's what we're dealing with for a while, the northern kingdom. It's going to be a setup for a prophet that's going to occupy in, beginning in chapter 17, a large section called Elijah the prophet. But we're going to be dealing with the northern kingdom, five successive kings, all of them bad, and it will go from bad to worse by the end of this chapter. I mean, it's already been bad, but just you ain't seen nothing yet. So we have five successive kings. Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, that's an important name, the son of Hanani, 
It's also an important name. Against Baasha, saying, Inasmuch as I lifted you out of the dust and made you ruler over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam and have made my people Israel sin to provoke me to anger with their sins, surely I will take away the posterity of Baasha and the posterity of his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Jehu. Jehu is the son of Hanani, it says. This is a prophetic family. This is a ministry family. This is a like father, like son family. Hanani was the prophet that I just talked about that came to King Asa and said, what are you doing trusting in that northern alliance? How come you're not seeking the Lord? Now there's going to be war all of your days for the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth. Hanani was that prophet. His son is Jehu. His son, Jehu, comes to Baasha in Israel. But here's what I want you to remember about Jehu. It seems that he has a long stint as a man of God, as a prophet of God. Because we see him here, and we're going to see him again over in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, when he speaks to Jehoshaphat, so it's 50 years later, 50. So he speaks once here, he speaks again later. So he has a very long and productive, fruitful ministry speaking to these kings. 50 years later, he's still at it. So Jehu, you know, came and, and rebuked him. Now, it actually doesn't say he came. Because, you know, prophets, when they stand in front of altars and point to it and say, this is going down, you're going down, they tend to get into trouble or they tend to get arrested or killed or threatened. But there's no mention of that here. He could have simply gotten the word from the Lord and sent a letter to him. We don't know. But somehow the king got the message and this prophecy was uttered forth. God said, I'm going to take away your posterity, the posterity of Baasha and the posterity of his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now, they're not related. Baasha is not the physical descendant of Jeroboam, but he is the spiritual descendant of Jeroboam. His sin is very similar, just a little bit worse. He just kicks the can down the road. So uh, look at this judgment. It's very similar to what we read last time. The dog shall eat whoever belongs to Baasha. Jeroboam got the same treatment. And dies in the city. The birds of the air will eat whoever dies in the fields. Now the rest of the acts of Baasha, what he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah, of, of Israel? So Baasha rested with his fathers, was buried in Tirzah, then Elah, his son, reigned in his place. And also the word of the Lord came by the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha and his house, because of all the evil he did in the sight of the Lord in provoking, watch this, provoking him, who him? God, capital H, provoking him to anger with the work of his hands in being like the house of Jeroboam and because he killed them. It says that this king provoked God to anger. Do you realize how hard it is to provoke God to anger? God doesn't easily get ticked off. It takes a lot to provoke him. When the Lord revealed himself to the Israelites through Moses, God introduced himself as long-suffering, merciful, one who extends pardon generation after generation. Listen to this in Psalm 103. 
He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. So when we read that this king provoked God to anger, it had to be pretty bad because God doesn't easily get angry. He's long-suffering. He's slow to anger. A word about what we just read so far. You will notice that the prophet came and said to the king, thus says the Lord, I raised you up from the dust. I gave you prominence. He said that to Baasha. Yet Baasha was the one who killed and conspired and murdered the king and his family. So on one hand, you have human sin and murder and error. At the same time, you have God saying, I raised you up. Well, that's interesting. How do you square that one? Here you have a perfect example of human responsibility mingled with divine sovereignty. How that men and women can make choices, but that God overall is providentially setting things up, pulling the strings, even using the sin and wrath of people. God said in the Psalms, the wrath of man will praise him. It doesn't mean that the person who commits the murder, the conspiracy, the conniving goes off scot-free. No, no, no. He's held responsible. Yet God is sovereign at the same time, causing all things to work together for good to those who love him. It's amazing, really. Let me give you another example of that. In the book of Acts, Peter stood up and said to the people in Jerusalem, God, um, oh no, Jesus, who by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands, crucified and put to death. What a mix. On one hand, he says, this was God's predetermined plan and purpose. You are responsible for killing the author of life. You did this by your wicked hands. You're responsible for that act, that sin. But God also purposed and planned for that to happen and used your bad choice to accomplish his good purpose. So I just want you to see how this providence thing works out and, and how how these principles go together. So, this guy provoked the Lord to anger. He sinned against him, but God was using him and even takes credit for raising him up, according to the prophet. Verse 8, in the 26th year of Asa, the king of Judah, Elah, the son of Baasha, became king over Israel and reigned two years in Tirzah. Now again, get used to this dating pattern. A king is introduced, but the reference date is the date of the king's reigning in the opposite kingdom. So in the year that this king was doing this there, this guy began his reign. So that's the dating process. You can kind of figure out when and how long that king has been reigning to get the start date and end date of the king in the opposite kingdom. Now his servant, so let's back that up. Now we have Elah, Elah, verse 8, the son of Baasha. He's now the king. Elah is the king up north in Tirzah. Now he has a servant, verse 9. His servant Zimri, commander of half his chariot, so he's a general in the army, conspired against him. See, all these people with their, these are politicians. Sorry to be so negative when it comes to these things, but... I am aging, <laughs> so I've seen a lot. 
Now his servant Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him as he, that is the king, King Elah, was in Tirzah, the capital, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, a lot of Z's in this sentence, steward of his house in Tirzah. Alcohol always complicates any gathering. This guy's drinking, he has one too many, now he's sauced, drunk. Zimri went in and struck him and killed him in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. So exactly what happened to him, uh, or what he did happened to him, it came to pass when he began to reign as soon as he was seated on the throne that he killed all the household of Baasha. Another dynasty wiped out. Did not leave him one male, neither of his kinsmen, get this, nor of his friends. So if you just knew the guy, you were a buddy of his, you were a neighbor, you met him at Starbucks, you're dead. You're an associate of the king, killed his kinsmen and his friends. Now this was common practice, I hope you know, that when kings took over the kingdom of another, they usually killed all the family. It's just cleaner that way. It's just a lot easier when everybody's dead. You have a fresh start. You know, nobody's going to conspire against you, so you just come in, you're the king, kill them all, and then you start over. That was common practice. There is one glorious, refreshing exception to this. King David. When David went and occupied the throne of Israel, he said, who is left of the house of Saul that I might show kindness, the kindness of the Lord to? Very, very different. Wanted to show love and kindness and mercy and forgiveness. No wonder God called him a man after his own heart. Thus Zimri destroyed the household of Baasha according to the word of the Lord, verse 12, which he spoke against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son, by which they had sinned and by which they had made Israel sin, in provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. What's the principle here? The wages of sin is death. Sin, listen, sin kills. Sin kills. If you want to see how bad sin can get, you want to see how horrible it is, look at the cross. That's what my sin and your sin did to Jesus. Sin kills. He took it, so you don't have to take it, but sin here took their lives. The wages of sin is death. Now the rest of the acts of Elah, again, northern kingdom, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So think of it. Within a time span of 50 years, five zero years, Two dynasties have now been completely obliterated, destroyed. None of them left. They're all dead. In the 27th year of Asa, the king of Judah, Zimri reigned in Tirzah. He had a long reign, seven days. You know, by this time, you're thinking, yeah, I don't, this whole king gig... I don't think I want to do that. I'm not running for that office. Because of this kind of stuff. Now, what happens is that the new guy, the young guy or gal or whatever says, no, 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 I, this is a new administration and I have better plans and bigger plans and I get a shot at it and it'll be different this time. Well, he had a shot for a week. He reigned for seven days, shortest of the 
reigns of the northern kings. It was Tom Petty who sang, it's good to be king, if just for a while, be there in velvet, give him a smile. That's about all this guy had time for is a nice smile and he's dead, lights out. And the people were encamped against Gibbethon, that's that town where, which belonged to the Philistines. Can you see just by this little verse, the Philistines had always been a problem to Israel. They'd been a long-standing enemy. In fact, before the quick, quick, quick history lesson, before the Neo-Assyrian and Neo-Babylonian empires, before the two empires that ruled the world that took captive the northern and southern kingdom, before those kingdoms, the big enemy on the block that was the provocation and problem child for Israel were the Philistines. And it was David who largely got the upper hand and drove them away, but now post-David, some of them are still around and, and inculcated in different strongholds, still around, still a problem. Now today, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who said, I'm a Philistine. We don't have that genetic production of that anymore. There are no Philistines, although there is a term that relates to the Philistines that has been used for a long time and is still in use today in that part of the world called Palestinian. Palestinian is a word that is the Romanization of the word Philistine. It's the Latinized form of Philistine. But get this. Nobody referred to themselves as a Palestinian until modern history. Well, where did that term came from? In 135 AD, a Roman emperor by the name of Hadrian decided to desecrate the temple, put false images and pagan images in the temple, renamed the city of Jerusalem to Aelia Capitolina, made it a pagan city, and to wipe the memory of the Jews away from Judea, renamed Judea Palestine, to eradicate the name and the history of Israel from the land. That's where it came from. Now, that name stuck, and so the ancient maps, even in, in some of the old King James Bibles, will say Palestine at the time of Christ. And it was a, a word used up until the British Mandate in the early 1900s. And then, 1948, May 14th, became the modern state of Israel. So uh, if you go to Jerusalem and say, I'm happy to be in Palestine, uh, you will not get a lot of friends because they say, oh, this is not Palestine, this is Israel. This is the land God gave to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and we're back. So anyway, that's just sort of a little um, rabbit trail on the name Philistines. Now the people who were encamped heard it, not what I just said, but heard about this, <laughs> and said, Zimri has conspired and has also killed the king. So all Israel, watch this. So all Israel made Omri, the commander of the army king, over Israel that day in the camp. Then Omri and all Israel with him went up from Gibbethon, fighting the Philistines, and they besieged Tirzah, capital. It happened when Zimri saw the city was taken that he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house down upon himself with fire, and he died. What's going on here? Well, a conspiracy. This guy kills the king. That is Zimri. Zimri's now the king. Um, this is before the days of texting or Twitter, so nobody can tweet, hey, Zimri's the king. So eventually... He's crowned king there, but it takes a while for the news to get down to where the battle is. The battle is fought by the commander-in-chief of the army named Omri. When the 
soldiers find out Zimri's king? Omri, our general, should be the king. They crown him the king. He has all the firepower behind him. They go back to town, back to the headquarters. Zimri sees them coming and has the sudden realization, there ain't no way I'm going to win this battle. My whole army has inaugurated General Omri as the new king. I'm dead meat. So what does he do? Well, we're told. He went into the citadel, that is the palace of the king's house, and burned the king's house down upon himself with fire and died. He, he fired himself. <laughs> because of the sins, he sinned in doing evil in the sight of the Lord and walking in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin, which he had committed to make Israel sin. He committed suicide. This is similar to what Samson did when he was caught by the Philistines and his last act in that Philistine temple chained to the pillars was to pull down with his strength that the Lord gave him the pillars upon himself and the Philistines. This is also similar to what Saul did in wanting to kill himself with his sword on Mount Gilboa. But Samson is more akin to this uh, because he took down with him the palace at the same time. So one of the few suicides in the Bible, and now he's gone. The rest of the acts of Zimri and the treason which he committed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. Half the people, get this, watch this, new name, followed Tibni, the son of Ganath, to make him king, and half followed Omri. Do you see how jack this is, how weird this is. So you got a 12 tribes split in two, north and south, Israel, Judah. Then in Israel, you have a king. They don't like it. They crown the general, the king, because he has the firepower. But not everybody agrees. They bring in another guy, the independent. <laughs> and now it's divided again. So uh, a lot of uh, palace intrigue going on, a very, very divided country. If you think our country's divided now, and you compare it to this, I, I, I at least take a little bit of hope and joy in making a comparison between our situation and ancient Israel. This is really bad. Of course, they're about to face God's judgment. So, Because of the sins which he sinned in doing evil, I'm reading verse 19, walking in the way of Jeroboam and a sin which he committed to make Israel sin. Now, oh, I already read that. So I already read that too. Well, I'm, I'm divided. Okay, verse 22. But the people who followed Omri prevailed. That's the general. That's the commander of the army. The people who followed Omri prevailed over the people who followed Tibni, the son of Ganath. So Tibni died and Omri reigned. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king over Israel and reigned 12 years. Six years he reigned in Tirzah. Quick word about Omri. He was a very capable leader. As far as just on a pure secular level, he was brilliant. He was a general, after all. He did stabilize the country. In fact, um, ancient Assyrian records, the Assyrian Chronicle, calls the land of Israel by the name the land of Omri. It uses him in a way of respect to acknowledge his capable reign. Also, in the Louvre in France, in Paris, France, there is a stone called the Moabite Stone. If you're ever in the neighborhood there, go see it. It's worth looking at. It's an ancient inscription, stone, stella, and it has different names written by the Moabite kings, and one of them acknowledges Omri in his fight against the Moabites. So his name is prominently mentioned there. 
And by the way, Omri's dynasty is a pretty long-lasting dynasty. His sons, grandsons, etc., will rule the northern kingdom up until 2 Kings chapter 10. So it's not like seven days, two years. It's a long time. So he was a capable king. But he was an idolater, and he, spiritually speaking, was not a good guy. Verse 24, And he bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver. Two talents of silver, oh, by today's standard, about $50,000, $54,000. I would say he got a good deal because he made that hill a city, the king, uh, Samaria, it's called. And he built on the hill, he called the name of the city which he built Samaria, after the name Shemer, the owner of the hill. So get this. Originally, the headquarters of the northern kingdom was Shechem. Remember that name, Shechem? Then it moved to Tirzah. We've been reading about that the last couple chapters. It now moves again to Samaria. And Samaria becomes the center of the northern kingdom. And the difference between Samaria and Jerusalem is not only seen in the Old Testament, but shows up even in the New Testament when Jesus had to go through Samaria and met a woman at the well there. It's a very, very interesting story played out on the stage of Scripture. Don't have time to get much into it more than that, except to say, there, is, there has been, there was an archaeological dig in Samaria. I've been to Samaria, I've seen the archaeological digs, but the one conducted by Harvard University found a stone in Samaria with the inscription of King Omri on it as the palace of King Omri, and it was found in the palace area. So they've identified the palace of King Omri. You could still see it today, although it's not in a, uh, the easiest place to get to, not in the best place. Uh, we don't usually take tours there uh, for reasons of safety, but can be seen. Omri, verse 25, let's finish this out, did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all who were before him. What? How is that possible? How is it possible to get worse than what we've just read? Here's how. Jeroboam built two what? Golden what? Calves, one in Dan, one in Bethel. But he wasn't worshiping another god. He was worshiping God. He was worshiping Yahweh, the God of the Jews. But he was worshiping the true God in a false way. And it was voluntary. He didn't make people do it. He allowed people to do it. And he tried to dissuade people from going to Judah, but it was voluntary. This guy made it mandatory. That's how he, he outsinned even the previous people before him. He walked in the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in the sin which he made Israel sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. Now the rest of the acts of Omri which he did, the mighty, uh, or the might that he showed, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Omri... Kicked the bucket, rested with his fathers, buried in Samaria. Here it is. You think he was bad? Then Ahab, his son, reigned in his place. We'll finish out the chapter, and then we'll, that'll be good introduction next time to get into chapter 17 and 18, which introduces us to Elijah the prophet. In the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah, Ahab... The son of Omri became king over Israel, and Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. It came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth, that he took as his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, the king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab and Jezebel, 
a marriage made in hell. <laughs> we'll read more about him next time, and them. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In the days of Hiel, of Bethel, Belt Jericho, he laid its foundation with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his son, Segub. Segub, who names his kid Segub? Uh, well, <laughs> he set up its gates according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Joshua, the son of... None, not Anun, the son of Nun, a son of Nun, as it would be said in Hebrew. So at least we said we finished the chapter, and we will use Ahab and Jezebel as the preface for the ministry of Elijah the prophet. What's coming up in the next few chapters is just classic. I love it. And I love teaching it, and I love teaching it on top of Mount Carmel, overlooking the valley that Elijah the prophet did these things in with Ahab and Jezebel. And if that's something you're interested in joining us on, we'll be going to Israel uh, again in May of 2024, just to get the word out. Uh, we already have 280 or something people signed up for that trip. So. Uh, we can take as many as want to come. We'll have tour guides on every bus. It will be an unforgettable experience, but to walk these places, be able to teach at these places, and be at these places and sing worship songs with Jeremy Camp as our worship leader, not a bad trip. So we invite you to come. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather with your people to go through the scriptures verse by verse, chapter by chapter, to read of the stories that form the basis for the upbringing of Peter, James, John, Paul, the scripture that Jesus quoted from. And Father, we thank you that we, living in the New Testament, can learn even from things like this in the Old Testament. These principles are timeless. And we pray, Lord, that you would deliver us from um, the kind of things that would cause us not to finish well. We pray, Father, whatever stage we are at in our spiritual walk, that you would motivate all of us to take the next step of service, of fellowship, of fruitfulness, for your glory, in Jesus' name. For more resources from Calvary Church in Skip Heitzig, visit calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us from this teaching in our series, Expound.